and thank you for joining us today for a webinar that has been brought to you by Wine Australia and the AWRI. My name is Robin Dixon and I'm a senior viticulturist at the AWRI. In the spirit of reconciliation, the AWRI acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. I'd I would also like to acknowledge Wine Australia for providing funding and support for webinars via the AWRI Extension Project. In this session, we'll look at new findings and implications of latest phylloxera research. But before we jump in, I have a few reminders for anyone who's new to the AWRI webinars. Um, if you would like to provide a comment or ask a question, please click on the Q&A button on the Zoom bar at the bottom of your screen. You type in the question, click send and send it through. Do this at any time. Uh, I can see that we've already got some um, comments coming through on the chat. Hello to everyone that's joining us. Wonderful. Um, so for anyone who has just joined us, welcome. Today's webinar topic is new findings and implications of latest phylloxera research. It's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Sharon Harvey from Wine Australia, Dr. Catherine Clark from Agriculture Victoria, uh, Lavinia Zernsack from Agriculture Victoria, and Suzanne McLaughlin from Vine Health. Australia. So first up, we're going to hear from Dr. Sharon Harvey. Dr. Sharon Harvey is an R&D program manager at Wine Australia, where she looks after projects in the areas of climate adaption, climate mitigation, biosecurity and pests and diseases. Sharon is currently working closely with others in the sector to develop a roadmap towards carbon neutrality for Australian wine. Sharon, if you're ready to make a start, I'll hand over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Robin. I'll just get my screen up. Okay, hopefully you can see that. Perfect. Okay, um, so welcome everyone. I'm just going to do a very short um, introduction and then hand over to the to the researchers and the important people in this space. Um, so my name is Sharon Harvey. I um, manage the, um, the phylloxera projects um, in Wine Australia and Wine Australia has been um, investing in phylloxera research and development for uh, well over a, a decade now and the, the latest projects have been um, with Agriculture, um, Agriculture Victoria Research um, the latest project, project finished sort of late last year and that's the work that we're going to explore today um, and we've um, got a new project with APIC Research to, um, to pick up on some of those findings and explore them further and um, Catherine will touch on those in a minute. So I guess firstly um, just to acknowledge that um, Wine Australia understands that phylloxera remains a priority for the Australian wine sector. We are vulnerable. We have uh, not a great proportion of our vines are planted on resistant rootstocks. So uh, if it spreads beyond the, the current containment zones, then um, all, of our, all of our commercial grape vines and our heritage grape vines are, um, are vulnerable to attack from phylloxera. Um, so we've been investing in areas um, to do with management of phylloxera, and that includes detection, disinf disinfestation and containment. Um, and it's worth noting that um, the AGVIC team and Catherine's work in particular um, was awarded the ASVI Viticulture um, Paper of the Year in um, 2018 for their work on disinfestation of, of footwear for, um, for phylloxera. Um, we also uh, conduct fundamental research on phylloxera biology and control options, which helps us to um, feed into management strategies updating of rootstock resistance status around the, the biotypes of phylloxera that are, are present in Australia. 
Uh, we invest with uh, CSIRO to develop grapevine rootstocks with, um, with durable phylloxera resistance. So looking, for, looking to the future um, and there'll be more to come in this space and um, Catherine will touch on what the next project is, um, is going to investigate in a minute. So um, I think that's enough from me. So I will stop sharing and hand back to Robin to continue. Wonderful. Thank you, Sharon. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Catherine Clark. Dr. Catherine Clark is a research scientist at Agriculture Victoria Research. Catherine is, a, is the chief investigator for the AVR Phylloxera research and will reflect on findings from the recently completed project co-funded by Wine Australia and AVR, as well as ongoing and future phylloxera studies. Catherine, if you're ready, I'll hand over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Robin. And thank you so much for, uh, for giving us this opportunity to share the findings from the previous research. And the project was entitled Integrated Management of Established Gripvine Phylloxera. And the, the, it was a carry on really, and we are very grateful for the co-investment co in funding for phylloxera research for over um, several decades. And most of the research is built on from the previous research. And this, this research was also built on from another project that ran until 2017. Uh, so this work was carried out by a team of researchers, and I'm going to represent some of the findings from uh, a team of about uh, nine people. And um, so without much ado, we'll go straight on to the findings. Uh, the research themes for the last three years were looking at phylloxera detection, disinfestation procedures, rootstocks and phylloxera interactions, phylloxera biology and genetic diversity and biological control. And, and Sharon has uh, summarized this really well and where the research is really important in fitting the information for management. And uh, with these themes, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on each one of them and briefly highlight on the findings. Uh, starting on phylloxera detection, uh, the, the current detection method um, is, or, or what, what growers do, or what uh, Lavinia will talk about it as well, is once phylloxera is suspected in a vineyard, uh, the biosecurity officers will go into the vineyard and look uh, uh, and use the roots, um, the digging method, which, we, which is looking at the root and inspecting to see if there are insects or signs of damage on the roots. And that method uh, was, uh, would need to be improved. And one of the, um, the uh, what we wanted to do is look for a new tool that can rapidly in detect phylloxera in the field and mark blackets at, um, within our team at AgroBio and his, and his team looked at a new tool, which is, which is called LAMP. And LAMP is the loop mediated isothermal amplification that is now starting to be used for rapid insect diagnostics. The LAMP test, which you see here is detect insect target DNAs within, within an hour. And the results are visual and easily detected using a LAMP machine. That's the LAMP machine. It's the size of a laptop. And um, it's, it's portable, so it can be take, carried into the vineyard. And what Mark and his team did is they went to the vineyard and optimized um, methods using LAMP to confirm the identity of phylloxera in bucket traps. And what they did is put uh, the insect samples onto tubes, which are run in the, in the LAMP machine. And then it gives you um, visual detection to tell you whether that sample has phylloxera or not. And the Mark were able to develop methods for root sampling and successfully detected phylloxera in 18 vine root samples. And what that meant for, um, for biosecurity teams is that LAMP 
is a is a is a is a is an exciting tool at the moment that could remove the requirement for human visual detection, uh, which 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 will make it rapid as well in terms of it gives a turnaround within one hour. Uh, previously, uh, 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 the grower would have to have waited for up to a week to find out if they have phylloxera or not. And that means that uh, the quarantine measures can come into place as soon as possible. Uh, the next thing we looked at was improved disinfestation procedures. And this is also uh, uh, um, uh, uh, some, some studies that were carried on from the previous project, where currently to stop phylloxera infestations from, uh, to, from spreading from infested to non-infested zones, the current best practice disinfestation for footwear and handheld tools is to dip or, or stand in a foot bath for, uh, of bleach that made to a concentration of 2% for one minute without a follow-up rinse. However, bleach is not quite favorable because of the, the hazards posed by chlorine odors and also in terms of because we are not rinsing off with water, then the footwear and the tools get damaged very quickly, which, which, which becomes an additional cost. So we set out to investigate whether we could find a suitable alternative to bleach. And we tested 22 products that are off the shelf. So we, we first did a, um, a, 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 a literature review uh, of products that have been used as disinfestations for, for footwear in other insect species and selected, as you can see in that table, uh, some of them did not get into the testing stage. For example, the ones that I have highlighted in red, those were toxic. And some of them we did test mineral turpentine and farm fluid, but the, the tubes that we use, the disinfestation tubes that we use got wrecked before we could even find uh, uh, going to the test. So we disregarded that those uh, ones be due to their toxicity. Uh, the others, the others that are not highlighted at all were not effective at all. So we found quite high survival. So the only product that was uh, effective against six phylloxerogenetic strains was data at a concentration of 5%. And so data was deemed suitable for using a practical setting and could be a, su a suitable alternative to bleach. Uh, the, on, in, in, um, in addition to improving the disinfestation or advancing the disin disinfestation procedures, we validated the fermentation procedures so currently then just procedure for grip for moving grip vine products or grip products such as wine ferments is to complete disinfestation for 72 hours to, to ensure efficacy. We tested five phylloxera strains in red and wine ferments with and without the addition of yeast. And yeah, it, it was very exciting to do this experiment and we were very grateful for AWI. We worked with Peter to find out how wine is made and we replicated these experiments in the lab using close to, to, to what the winemaking process is. And then uh, we dipped in phylloxera at different indeplicated trials to see at what stage it, within the fermentation period is 100% uh, mortality achieved. So without yeast, for example, in this figure, we found that uh, fermentation of grip products for at least three hours um, or three days, sorry, which is 72 hours is only valid when yeast is added to the wine ferments. Where wine was, where yeast was not added to the wine ferment, the survival was most was was close to survival in water or not fermenting at all. And we tested the alcohol content in red wine ferments with added yeast, and we found that the the ferment the alcohol could actually be a, 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 could also be used as a measure for. Uh, for fermentation or to find out whether uh, that the, the alcohol content, content would be a suitable measure to, for mortality 
um, for durations of time. And that is further work that we are going to be looking at, looking at whether the alcohol content of different wine farmings at specific time frames, where what's what's that level, and that work is underway at the moment. Uh, the next theme of the research we did is, uh, and Sharon has touched on this, is we're going to uh, rootstock selection uh, that informs the grapevine selector tool is, is important because rootstocks is the only known management method at the moment to, uh, to that, that uh, the, 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 it's the current method for managing phylloxera worldwide and developing rootstocks that are um, uh, and testing and developing rootstocks is, is, is work that we do in collaboration with CSIRO, with the team led by, uh, by Harley Smith. And in these circumstances, or, and in this project, we looked at one of the rootstocks that is widely planted in Victoria and South Australia, because it hasn't been tested, it's widely planted due to its tolerance to, li to lime and well suited to well drained and uh, well drained soils. And we wanted to also find out, or, or the industry recommended that we test this uh, against the diverse genetic strains. And I have to say here that the, the phylloxera that we use for studies um, or to test, for example, with rootstocks and disinfestation procedures fall under different clades. They have their diverse genetically. So we want to be sure that the phylloxera that we are testing or the rootstocks that are testing have, uh, we want to test whether they have the tolerance or the, res the same resistance or when phylloxera of diverse uh, genetics is attacking those rootstocks. Um, usually in the lab or the best, uh, the, the, the protocols we use, we use potted vines and excised roots because uh, we, we appreciate that finding a vineyard that is infested with diverse phylloxera is not, um, is, is not something we come across. So most of the work is done under controlled conditions. And in this case, we used input vines and we subjected uh, we, we put in 20 eggs of, of, five, of six phylloxera strains and we assessed that after eight weeks in pot vines, we found feeding induced damage uh, for all the five genetic strains that is G4, G19, G20, G30 and G, G38. And this is the sort of damage that we found. So that's a nodosity and also uh, ne necrotic pseudotuberosities, as you see there with the red sign. And so meaning that uh, the fi five genetic strains cause uh, feeding induced damage on 5C teleki. And on excise roots, we found that G1, as you see in those blue bears, G19, G20, G30, and G38 developed to reproductive adults. And what that tells us is that those, those five genetic strains can, um, can, can maintain suitable populations on 5C teleki, making it tolerant. And we, we, we rated 5C teleki as tolerant because the numbers were much lower than Vitis vinifera. I haven't, yeah, this, the numbers were much lower than Vitis vinifera. And, but that means tolerance characteristics still means that they can have a populations of phylloxera. Uh, the other study we did was a case study where we looked at performance of G38 phylloxera on different rootstocks. And to give a brief of a background, G38 was first characterized on as a leaf galling strain in Glen Rowan in, in, in the early 20, 2000. And uh, in this case study, we found that G38 uh, was attacking a block of vines in um, a block of vines that 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 were a mixed root stocks. Um, these were the rootstocks in that block. And what we found is that there were higher, we, we put out traps for three years and found that 101.14 were higher numbers 
of crawlers and airlets were caught in traps for over three years consistently. This is the main for three years and Swartzman ranked second. Compared to Vitis Vinifera, G38 performed much better on this, on, on 101 particularly. And when we, we, we did these experiments in the lab using excise root assays, where we looked at the reproductive performance, where this tells us does, is G38 also reproducing on if we did it on excise routes as it is as, as it was in the field and the results collaborated what corroborated what we found in the field with uh, total numbers of eggs laid per female significantly higher than the other root stocks and what that tells us is that 10114 and Swartzman were most susceptible to G38 compared to their own rooted vines and that could be a cause of concern uh, based on the fact that G38 also exists as a root go as a leaf growing strain. And I'll talk about one of the things we are going to be doing in this study is looking at, uh, at, at the leaf growing strain incidences within uh, in the King Valley and the Northeast region where Phylloxera exists. Um, and also the, the one of the um, one of we, we also validated that our current screening assays are suitable for predicting resistance and, suscepti and susceptibility of rootstocks. The um, the genetic diversity study was conducted last in two in early two thousand, and in the previous project we looked at finding out what's happening uh, because 20 years, that was done 20 years ago. And um, previously, uh, what we are finding now, we collected 14,000 phylloxera samples from 18 blocks and 764 uh, samples were genotyped, 36 strains were identified. And of those 32 were found to be new, they have not been uh, characterized before. And vines were frequently found to have more than one genetic strain. And this is one of the questions that we have been asked, do we find genetic strains on one vine? And that was one of the findings. And what this tells us is that possibly sexual reproduction, the production is happening within the King Valley and that requires further study, uh, further studies. So what we found is that out of, we, we knew of 83 genetic strains in Australia, but now that has come up to 115. And this study is continuing as I'm going to mention in the current project to find out whether there might be um, other genetic strains that are existing as leaf galling, because we only looked at the root galling uh, phylloxera in this case. Um, so we also looked at experiments that explore the effects of temperature on phylloxera survival. And this is as uh, we, we talk about changes in the climate and what's happening and whether and, and the movement of phylloxera, is that going to be impacted by temperatures? And we conducted experiments using diverse phylloxera and evaluated their survival, reproduction, and uh, um, when they are provided with a food source and without a food source. And on a food source, we found that when attached to a root, phylloxera development was optimal at 22 to 26 degrees. And at 30 degrees and above, there, uh, there was the, the production G19, G20, and G30 did not, develop, did not reach adulthood. Um, but what was surprising for us is that survival phylloxera, while not attached to a vine root, was longer than previously thought. And longevity of G20 phylloxera was 29 at 18 in moist condition. And that is without having any food source. And Suzanne and Lavinia will be touching on that and how that implies to management, uh, to movement of, of material um, or to movement of machinery um, in, in, in real context. 
And lastly, um, so uh, uh, Ray did a comprehensive biological control of phylloxera review. Uh, this area we found was, was has been neglected and this review showed that there's potential for biocontrol using inoculation biocontrol through mass releases of commercially, commercially available biocontrol agents or using a classical biological control. And uh, from the review, Ray found that, the cyf that a siphon fly has potential because it can attack the adult and the juvenile stages. And it has been recorded as a, as, as a, as a, as a predator of root galling grip phylloxera in the USA. And in addition, biological control is also this potential for biopesticides that may uh, that, that, that could um, be used as a knockdown priority in, for, of priority infestations. And conservation biological control has also been trialed for other studies and we found that there's potential for that using, especially for leaf galling dispersing stages as they emerge from the soil. So what are we doing next? So the next phase of research is going to look at more effective surveillance diagnostics. Uh, current surveillance practice is using a grid approach which can be time consuming and costly. And new statistical models will be developed to define, uh, to better define phylloxera zones and boundaries. And the lump assay is going to be validated against visual inspection and look at ways of adopting the molecular lamp uh, technology for effective rapid and cost effective diagnostics. Uh, we're also going to be continuing with the improved selection of resilient rootstocks and screen some commercial rootstocks that, I, I, that have been identified by the industry as a priority. And we are going to, uh, we are collaborating, we have a project underway um, now where we're screening new rootstocks uh, based on the Australian context and environment and climate. And this, we're doing this in collaboration with Harley and the CRO, the CSIRO breeding team. Uh, we're going to be look, looking at improved validity of disinfestation procedures through the development of industry aligned protocols that assess hygiene. Uh, so we're going to be looking at soil contamination in machinery and to ensure that if in, in winter conditions um, that there's no survival to ensure that there's 100% there, there's, there's efficiency mortality in case of contaminated machinery um, that, that would be in terms of rain or harvesting if something gets caught in the machinery, how do we, uh, what are the best um, temperatures uh, using the dry heat method? Uh, we're also going looking at the improved knowledge of Australian phylloxera biology and ecology. And in this aspect I've mentioned about, we, in the previous project, we looked at the root galling strains and we, the question we are asking is, should we be worried about the leaf galling strain and what are the risks, risks to the industry and what causes the incidences of leaf galling strains? And so that we are ready for, um, on, in terms of management, if those strains um, start appearing. And lastly, we're looking at biological control through a clean and green conservation biological control approach with the aim of targeting all stages and forms of phylloxera. And um, we've got a, a, a project funded by BAS and Lavinia will talk about it, uh, biopesticides as a disinfestation treatment for roots and cuttings. Uh, so I'm presenting this is the team that has that was involved in the previous project and still is carrying on the future of uh, phylloxera research. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow, that was um, a huge amount of information that you um, presented there. I'm looking forward to the Q&A sec section at the end of this um, webinar. 
Um, now I'd like to introduce Lavinia Zernsack. Lavinia is the Senior Policy Officer in the Chief Plant Health Officers Unit for Agriculture Victoria. Lavinia leads the cont containment programs in domestic quarantine, including ph phylloxera management. The domestic quarantine unit is responsible for phylloxera management within Victoria, collaboration with the wine industry, and continuous improvement in phylloxera management and policy. Lavinia, if you're ready, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Robin. Okay, so um, thank you, Catherine. Um, obviously, uh, we were just asked to look at addressing some of how Catherine and John and AVR's research um, transcends down to policy and what we do in terms of Victoria from a regulatory perspective and also from a practical perspective. Um, so I guess I'll... Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I'll just invite you to share your screen now. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Uh, is that working? No. Hmm. Or PowerPoint open. Yeah. Sorry. Just yeah. To share screen. Ah. I clicked on the wrong one. Wonderful. Thank you. Apologies. That's okay. So <laughs> now, now you'll just have to put it into presentation mode. Yep. Perfect. Lovely. Uh, now, um, could you, yes, lovely. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so, sorry for the false start. Um, so, ultimately, I'll loosely try to align to Catherine's themes around uh, detection, disinfestation, looking at the rootstocks, biology, biological control. Uh, heat treatment. We've also included a part in here which is kind of called um, uh, Dirty Boots Research because I guess whilst um, Catherine and her team do a lot of work in terms of uh, proving these things in lab, sometimes there's also understanding the practical environment and how that translates to uh, either regulations or treatments that we need to do in field. So we have, um, we've also got a heat treatment contract that we're looking at internally around actually assessing machinery and heat treatment rooms. Um, we're also finding as we work through things like our treatment schedules and our permit conditions, there's sometimes not clear alignment with terminology that's used in industries. So we've also got a Juice Mark and Must project uh, going this year to try to look at definitions and delineation between processes, which is proving quite complex. Um, and I'll also just briefly touch on some of our tackling phylloxera outcomes for the project that's been going now for about five years in that tackling phylloxera space. So following on from Catherine's uh, discussion around land, so yeah, we completely agree. LAMP technology shows a lot of promise as a field-based diagnostic tool. Um, as Catherine said, you know, rather than having to wait for a week, because I believe the common practice in lab is to actually um, look at, get the phylloxera, do a slide mount, um, you know, do a morphological inspection and then actually move to, to LAMP for conf uh, confirmation. Um, you can just, if you've actually got part of an insect or an insect, you can do an in-field um, assessment. Um, LAMP's kind of, as um, Catherine touched on, you know, it's pretty, pretty adapted for field. There's about eight wells with a control um, and a negative, and then you can run pretty much six tests in those wells and Generally, I think you can get a peak within about 14 minutes once you've um, gone through the process. So um, the only drawback, or even drawback at this point in time, is that you, the um, technology is being validated for um, the insect, but I think it's still in the proof of concept phase 
for looking at um, if phylloxera has fed on roots of um, vines. Um, myself and my colleague Melissa, when we were out doing some of the rezoning work, um, we're actually running samples through the lamp machine for um, uh, any evidence of phylloxera feeding on roots. Clearly they all came back negative, but that was um, also in line of what we were finding in field. So um, it, I think this um, technology would be absolutely fantastic if it could be advanced to potentially looking at feeding damage on roots and having that validated. Um, so in terms of early detection, obviously, I think Catherine touched on a lot of John Weiss's work that he's been doing. He's been looking at things like using hyperspectral imaging, um, also combining that with drones, bucket traps, um, the dig um, process and lamp to be looking at sort of confidence intervals of detection with using one or a combination of all these early detection mechanisms. Um, so we've obviously been staying in contact with John in terms of where he's at with these and um, trying to implement uh, some of those things bit by bit in terms of our phylloxera surveys as well. Um, we also invested last year in a project with Gaia, which was around looking at remote sensing and machine learning for early detection of phylloxera. So it was a pilot model and hopefully we'll be able to build on that. It was pretty much trying to develop data sets at a local level where we knew there were infestations, coupling that with historical data and then trying to um, pull together an algorithm that could identify um, vine decline and weak spots. Um, so that was the first year's research. Uh, it looks very complicated. I'm still trying to dissect it, but ultimately, um, hopefully it will give us yet another tool combined with some of the above ones that are happening in AVR to have better early detection. I guess in um, uh, domestic quarantine and um, agriculture Victoria, we have you know finite resources and understanding where to go to um, best try to detect phylloxera, then using a somewhat of a scattergun approach will give us some um, a large advantage. Um, ultimately, still the current national accepted protocol is the National Phylloxera Management Protocol. So we're still at this point, uh, which is nationally accepted, is you know going through vineyards, um, you know, doing every fifth or tenth panel, digging down, looking at feeder roots and moving on, which is obviously very labour intensive and it's sort of treating the vineyard as a whole. So if we had some of these higher um, technology mechanisms um, available to us, we'd be able to um, hone in our inspection services to hopefully get um, a better result. So I think a combination of these in the future will be um, hopefully adapted in the next iteration of the MPMP. Um, obviously, in terms of the disinfestation procedures, um, we don't, uh, these won't actually make our way into new um, legislation per se, but it's um, very good policy. Um, anyone who's been out in the field could um, lay testament to the effect of um, sodium hypochlorite on all our tools and boots. So um, being able to use Dettol on our hand tools and our um, you know, boots will be a very welcome change. In terms of the rootstock and biology, um, this will be great in terms of industry management. Uh, once again, it probably doesn't um, have a huge impact in terms of legislation in Victoria and how we will regulate phylloxera. We tend to regulate phylloxera as one species, so it's just presence or absence of, not in strains. So I see that this research will be fantastic as uh, um, Catherine's explained in terms of rootstock selector tools. Uh, I think it also puts more emphasis on phylloxera exclusion zones to be um, you know, very vigilant in terms of host material and equipment moving out of those zones, because whilst there could potentially be some complacency around piz to piz movement, uh, you, know, you may perhaps not have one of those um, genotypes or strains 
uh, and therefore have less resistance on whichever root stock you're actually using. So um, this is very good um, farm gate biosecurity impetus. So I guess we still um, monitor and manage our uh, phylloxera movement via um, permits, treatments under those permits, certification, surveillance, uh, verification and other compliance activities. So essentially that's remained unchanged. As Catherine indicated, we've actually funded some work with ABR around the biological control and pesticide work. We're still, um, that's still in the process. Uh, they're looking at a couple of particular biopesticides that they can use to disinfest roots and cuttings for transport between zones. Apparently the hot water treatment can knock um, the vines around and affect their um, you know, performance when they're planted. So some of these biopesticides may have one, an impact on reduction of phylloxera, but also in terms of vine health as well to withstand some of those uh, treatments required for movement. So moving on to the uh, basically tackling phylloxera and the dirty boot research, as we call it. Um, so we're basically nearing the end of our tackling phylloxera program. It's like I said, been going for about five years now. So one of our major achievements has obviously been the rezoning of the Mornington Peninsula from a, um, a PRZ to a PEZ. Uh, that's been transitioning there. This was meant to actually finish within three years. Unfortunately, due to COVID and bushfires, another year had to be tacked on to finish surveillance in that area. That's due for announcement uh, next week. Um, the order is in train with governor and council. And um, so we're looking to have that uh, officially launched by the minister next week. So there's been a body of work in there. And as mentioned, we've used various tools in that one, such as um, LAMP technology as well, to try to increase our confidence level. And obviously that's been in line with the MPMP. Uh, we've also got the Viticulture Biosecurity Hub, which is meant to be a bit of a one-stop shop for Victoria, which actually highlights, uh, it's got Catherine's research on there and ABR's research with links in there. Um, we've also got uh, treatment schedules, legislation, links to our plant quarantine manual, um, best practice components. So, um, and it also has some of the research from the Tackling Phylloxera projects as well. Uh, there also, there's some um, documentaries and quite a few videos in there to look at as well. Um, another part of the work that was done under Tackling Phylloxera was the social research into industries, perceptions and behaviours. Um, that's some 56 page uh, report, but it, um, it's a very good report in terms of sort of the social science behind Phylloxera. So whilst we all put a lot of um, emphasis, I think, on um, technically understanding Phylloxera and mitigating risk of movement, um, there's obviously a lot to do with social science in terms of people's behaviours. So this report sort of addresses some of those concerns and attitudes. Uh, as Catherine alluded to, we funded work in lab, the genomics and the biopesticides. So it'll be really good to see the work continue with LAMP into the future. Um, the other thing we've got going on at the moment is a code of practice in the Phylloxera exclusion zones. So this is looking, it's taking a really comprehensive look at the um, risks associated with movements within a piece. So I guess there's a lot of emphasis put on movement outside of the piece, but this is um, not so much a regulatory tool, but trying to bring up industry standard in terms of maybe tackling the top five risks of movement within PIZ zones um, to ho hopefully lift up industry standards and have a benchmark. The other work that I'd spoken about previously was the heat treatment and disinfestation. So this is more the practical side to Catherine's work where she's actually looking at clods of dirt um, in lab at very controlled um, uh, temperatures and conditions to look at survival rates of phylloxera. This work will actually be looking at what is sort of industry standards and practices 
uh, what, what are machinery looking like when they're coming into heat treatment rooms? Is there some sort of standard? And also looking at, mm. to try to give industry some advice on how you reach uh, temperatures, appropriate temperatures, um, you know, in heat treatment rooms around ambient temperatures and also temperatures of equipment. And obviously bearing in mind that bins and, you know, harvesters may have a completely different set of um, criteria to reach those temperatures. So it's more of probably taking Catherine's um, scientific work and then trying to validate that in field so we can then provide industry with some better understanding of how to, uh, how to reach those targets. Um, there's also a juice mark and must project that we're looking at and that is more around um, trying to work out definitions of these where, where there's truly a you know, transition from these products and trying to work out what the industry standard is with those and the risks. Uh, another piece of work that was commissioned was the um, technical review of phylloxera mis uh, risk mitigation arrangements. And I think that actually helped to feed into some of Catherine's research in terms of areas to target. The other one I've spoken about before is our guy remote sensing and machine learning pilot. And um, we've got our first year's data and hopefully we'll be able to collect some more field data this year and then run that through the um, machine learning model that's been created by Gaia to see if we can create some better confidence in that model. Uh, this is just a little excerpt from our social research hypothesis. Uh, the social research concludes with the hypothesis that growers are being asked to apply a solution for complicated context that is a set of instructions, the national protocol, to a complex environmental situation, which could explain the failure by existing system to ultimately stop the spread of phylloxera, which in turn gives rise to growers' attitudes of resignation, complacency and indifference, and explains the inconsistencies in the application of practice to implement. Growers are not assembling a production line Ferrari, they are dealing with the web-like complexity of nature. So I guess that was just an excerpt from our social research to sort of depict the complexity um, of, of the systems we work within, within phylloxera. Uh, this is a picture of uh, some of our team um, in phylloxera. We have in our policy area, uh, we have myself part-time on phylloxera, Melissa um, full-time and obviously Gary. And then we obviously have our team of um, uh, operational staff within PCI that um, assist in this area too. So I'll probably leave it there. Thanks, Robin. Thank you, Olivia. Now I'd like to introduce Suzanne McLaughlin. Suzanne McLaughlin is the technical manager for Vine Health Australia, a role she has held for five years. Vine Health Australia was established in 1899 as, and is an independent South Australian statutory authority funded by SA vineyard owners with a single-minded focus on grape and wine biosecurity. As technical manager, Suzanne uses her biosecurity expertise to develop, implement, communicate and promote viticultural industry biosecurity policy and practices to improve wine sector sustainability. Suzanne brings extensive experience across a range of technical viticulture and grower relations roles for commercial wine growing operations around Australia to her current role. Thank you, Suzanne. I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Robin. Um, I'd just like to say thanks to Robin and to Sharon for inviting me to be part of today's webinar. So one of uh, Vine Health Australia's key roles is to review research and the industry to consider the relevance of this research um, in terms of findings that, are, um, that need to be considered um, for practice changes um, as part of farm gate hygiene and also then extended through 
uh, supply chains. And then I guess secondarily looking at um, new research from the um, perspective of our regulatory hat, if you like, and um, for South Australia in particular, evaluating um, the need for any regulatory changes that do come out of new, new research. And that um, area is which uh, that area is something that we work on with PERSA. So for these next few slides, I, I, I guess, just wanted to take you through um, once again, uh, Catherine's key findings and really outline the relevance to you of these key findings and what actions that you need to consider in response to these findings. So for us, really, the key finding from Catherine's project from a practical perspective was this finding of the lobster being able to survive for longer. So being um, eight days longer than what we previously thought um, based on any strains looked at through previous studies. Now, really what this means is that phylloxera has an increased window of opportunity to spread. And so what we need to do is look back at our current farm gate hygiene practices, practices which were based on a 21 day survival and modify those. And I guess through these strain survival studies, it's really important that we keep looking at um, how our endemic strains um, are, um, are faring in terms of different um, climatic areas, um, different temperatures, their, their ability to um, survive with and without food and um, with and without um, water, you know, in, in terms of soil moisture. And that really helps us look at um, potential adaptability of those strains um, in, in the face of um, a changing climate. So in terms of actions from this strain survival um, study, it's really important, as I said, for fungate hygiene practices now to be altered to reflect the 29 day survival as opposed to the 21 days which we were originally working on. So what we encourage you to do is to ask and check where machinery, equipment and any visitors coming to your property have been for at least the last 29 days before you consider granting controlled access to them. We also suggest that you look at any wording that you might have in business documentation, um, which may include um, your signing procedures. So you might have an app or you might have visitor signing records that you use. Um, or any training materials, or even any service agreements that you might have with contractors that currently currently uh, note the 21 day survival, but now that needs to be updated to reflect the 29 day survival. Um, if you do need to um, obtain any updated resources with this new uh, survival length, um, please feel free to obtain those from our website and you can uh, go under the tools section and there's various different fact sheets and posters, for example, for you to download. Um, and also looking at this strain survival um, increase from a regulatory perspective, um, we have undergone uh, quite comprehensive changes to our South Australian plant quarantine standard uh, over the last couple of years. And looking back at those changes that we made, they have covered us for these, um, this increase in eight days in, in phylloxera survival. So we're not seeing any immediate changes that need to be undertaken from a regulatory perspective to our PQS as a result of this increased um, knowledge about phylloxera survival. So another um, section of key work here was um, the, all, of, all of those different disinfectants that Catherine tested um, with regards to effectiveness against phylloxera strains for footwear and small hand tools. So as Catherine found, um, undiluted Dettol now is, is as effective as um, bleach for 60 seconds against this footwear and for small hand tools. Um, and so really obviously now that means we've got two recommended methods. Um, I did want to put here that um, through Catherine's work, it has also been shown um, that methylated spirits um, used as a 30 second undiluted immersion has also been found to be effective. Um, we're not actually recommending that formally, so you won't see that on any documentation. But for anyone who may be in a, um, say, organic situation where perhaps Dettol and, and um, bleach are not um, allowable, um, that may be an appropriate option for you under sort of certain control conditions, which you'll need to evaluate. 
So again, um, in terms of actions for industry from this one, um, I would suggest that you just have a look at all of the situations under which you may use um, bleach at the moment and work out whether Dettol might be more appropriate to use than bleach for any of those situations. And it may be that you think about the cost and the pack size that you might be able to get those in, um, which also might help um, you decide um, what's appropriate there. Um, I'd also suggest that you do download um, our footwear and small hand tool phylloxera disinfestation protocol poster, which you can get from our website. And that has been updated to include um, Dettol as part of the procedure as well. Um, one note from a regulatory perspective, um, for those who may have read the South Australian plant quarantine standards from cover to cover, um, you would notice that um, currently we do have um, bleach as an approved disinfestation treatment for small hand tools being imported into the state. But I did want to advise that Dettol has not yet been added as an approved sterilisation method. So just be aware if you are doing any importing into the state that you do look back at the um, state plant quarantine standards to see which methods are approved before you do undergo any of these particular um, disinfestation methods. Um, the next area of work being the rootstock screening work. So as Catherine said, she did a couple of different trials here. So one of them was to look at a range of rootstocks um, against the newest um, sort of key strain that she, she's found being the G38. And obviously, as um, Catherine reported, um, she did find that um, 10114 and Schwarzman in particular um, did seem to be susceptible to own roots. Now, whoops. Apologies. Um, I guess Catherine will probably talk more about this, um, this area, but um, it's really good to, for us to, I guess, think back about um, the range of rootstocks that we do have in Australia and, and also how we do manage our, um, our, our regions, I suppose, and I'll talk more about that um, from the actions perspective of what's important in terms of limiting strain movement. But um, one thing I suppose in terms of relevance of, of this type of research is that, you know, these are single studies and so more work does need to be done on um, really um, looking at why we might be seeing these certain results. But um, it's, it's important to know that we do have um, quite narrow um, rootstock parentage in Australia. And so therefore it's important that we do look to the future of trying to improve um, the available rootstocks we do have just in case there is, um, you know, any changes in the susceptibility of those rootstocks over time. Um, and one important point to make too, which Catherine did, did say as well, was that rootstocks that have been found to be tolerant to certain uh, strains are, um, can actually be hosts for those um, strains and can be, I guess, a reservoirs from which those strains can spread to more susceptible rootstocks or own rooted material. So that's really important. So just because you have a particular rootstock plant, it doesn't necessarily mean um, that that will be, um, you know, or that, that you won't be able to harbour um, harbor phylloxera that could then spread to more susceptible material. So Catherine's other um, area of research um, uh, under rootstocks, of course, was the Teleki 5C. So where she, um, in the glass house in the lab, not in the field, looked at um, the relevant tolerance of that particular rootstock against a range of strains. Um, once again, um, had variable results depending on the strain. So um, I'll talk about where you can actually find those results. Um, but yeah, it's really important, I guess, for us to be able to use the results of these um, studies to inform um, choices of rootstocks going forward. So in terms of actions from this area of study, um, there are a couple of um, resources that you can look at, which will help you um, to utilise, I guess, um, biosecurity or, or phylloxera, um, relative phylloxera resistance or tolerance for each rootstock that you might be considering planting um, against a range of strains. And there's a couple of um, resources being the phylloxera um, strain 
um, rootstock interaction table, which we have on our website, and also Wine Australia's Grapevine Rootstock Selector Tool, which I'll talk about in the next couple of slides, which helps present um, yeah, the biosecurity aspects of different rootstocks, as well as many other factors that you may choose in terms of um, reasoning for going with one rootstock rather than another. Um, once again, um, it's really important um, for you to focus on implementing your farm gate hygiene practices to limit strain, introduction and spread. Um, once you've got a particular um, rootstock planted, for example, um, you don't want to then have that become more susceptible due to the introduction of another strain which you hadn't imagined being present when you actually chose that rootstock in the first place. So this area of work really just shows for us that it's important to continue this rootstock strain interaction research so that we can better understand um, where we should be planting certain rootstocks. Um, also that it's important to encourage future, re future rootstock breeding work and trying to increase the, um, the uh, I guess the, um, the well, minimise the amount of breakdown that could potentially happen through our reef stocks um, to different strains. And so it's really trying to make that, um, what's making those root stocks more um, resistant to certain strains um, a lot stronger, which will come through um, utilising um, breeding techniques. Um, and also, it's also important, I guess, that new root stocks that are released to um, industry to use have also been tested using a, um, a range of these um, endemic phylloxera strains that Catherine and Harley are working on. So we'd certainly implore um, that sort of work to, to continue so that new root stocks that do come onto the market, we know um, their abilities to withstand different phylloxera strains. So just quickly here, this is um, just a quick snapshot of the Grapevine Rootstock Selector Tool, um, which you can find at this particular web address at the bottom. Um, what you do is you put in um, your ideals for certain attributes that you're looking for in a rootstock, and the tool will narrow down um, a range of rootstocks that fit that bill. And you can also click on phylloxera information, which will bring up um, any particular strain information that's relevant to that particular rootstock in a color coded table for you. And that just gives you another um, attribute, I guess, on, on which you can choose a rootstock for your particular situation. So the other section here we're talking about um, is genetics. And as um, Catherine said, um, we've now found a whole lot of new strains. Um, which has taken our tally from 83 to 115. And interestingly, these were found to be closely related to each other and to previous strains previously detected in the Northern King Valley area in which the study was done. Um, Catherine also said that um, this could be because the strains were closely um, related, that it could be an indication of sexual reproduction, um, which is obviously yet to be determined. But I guess, the background to that and why that's of interest is that the sexual reproductive cycle actually includes a winged form. And so naturally that would mean that if, if that winged form was available, um, it would actually bring around, um, bring about um, a risk of uh, long range dispersal of those particular strains and therefore obviously further spread. Um, and also I guess with sexual reproduction, when you've got a combination of different um, strains recombining into, into another strain, it means that you can have enhanced adaptability to new or changing environments. And so for us, that's just something to consider going forward in a changing climate as well. Um, one tool we do have, which I'll show you on the next slide here, is um, based on Catherine's research, we, we already um, had a strains map from previous studies that were undertaken by AgVic, um, but we have actually updated that strains map as well, just to reflect um, the findings from this, this latest um, area of study um, to show where those different strains have been found. Um, once again, I guess in terms of actions for industry from this section, um, really important for you to maintain vigilance of farm gate hygiene to 
um, limit the amount of introduction and spread of new strains between um, phylloxera zones, and also, once again, to utilise the available tools, um, such as the grapevine rootstock uh, tool, to enable you to um, have a look at um, the phylloxera attributes of rootstocks you may be considering planting. So the last area here, we've got a detection. And um, here we know that um, the AgVic team has developed um, a LAMP based, uh, sorry, a tool called LAMP, which is a DNA based tool. Um, and that enables, enables um, phylloxera diagnosis within an hour um, for use on farm and in the lab. And as Lavinia said, that's a great advancement um, in terms of time um, and enables much more rapid um, uh, regulatory response to a new detection because of that time. Um, and once again, um, really good that it can allow for infill checking of results from the visual route inspection or the, what we call the dig method at the moment and also from emergence traps. So it's quite adaptable. Um, from an industry perspective, um, at the moment, um, we're sort of saying there's no actions um, really until that test has completed its, um, its trial phase, but um, certainly something to look forward to on that front. And from a regulatory perspective, we certainly do see a great opportunity for this tool to assist us in, in the um, prevention and response capability for South Australia um, to incorporate that tool um, with others um, in, in our plans. And so we've certainly... Um, yeah, been talking to the Saudi labs to, to stay abreast of, of this LAMP tool. I just wanted to finally finish on um, a slide. Um, if you are considering, I guess, reflecting on any of these um, research findings that, that Catherine's talked about today, and you do want to know um, if any of those are applicable to your state plant quarantine standards or equivalent, we do have a slide on our um, website here, which um, provides different state biosecurity department contact lists. And um, yeah, feel free to give your state biosecurity department a call and just to discuss whether any of your, um, you know, legislation does need to be um, reviewed in light of any of these particular research findings. And lastly, I just wanted to give a plug to an article um, which we um, put out through the Great Brown Winemaker um, this, just this month, which some of you may have seen, which does talk a lot about um, what I've discussed and what, and we also did this in conjunction with Catherine and her team. And um, yeah, it gives sort of an overarching view of the research and, and what actions we believe industry does need to take in response to these actions. Thank you. Um, and uh, I would encourage anyone to um, go and have a read of, of the Great Grower and Winemaker article that Fine Health uh, wrote with um, Catherine. It's a really um, well-written article and it um, really explains the research and, and the actions from that um, really clearly. So thank you. I'd like to invite uh, all of our panellists back on to... Uh, for the Q&A uh, section of this webinar. Uh, just before we start off, um, Nick Dry has kindly um, made a comment. Um, so just to clarify that hot water treatment um, is, is really a key um, tool uh, in minimising the spread of a range of pests and pathogens. And if the hot, hot water treatment protocols are um, followed correctly, they shouldn't have an impact on young vine performance. So Nick Dry is um, a consultant from Foundation Viticulture and he's working um, with Wine Australia and um, the propagation sector to um, uh, review the or create a new grapevine propagation standard. So um, yeah, hot water treatment is definitely key um, for um, the health of our young vines. Right, so we have quite a few questions that are coming along. Uh, so Suzanne, uh, you, uh, there's a question here asking how, um, so whether there's information about the different strains of phylloxera in the Yarra Valley. So um, you showed the map 
um, that you have available on your website, which shows where the stra different strains have been detected. Is there any other information that um, Sil Silvana can um, look up to find out more information about that? Sure. Well, um, I should probably let the Victorians speak on behalf of this, but um, from my perspective, I was only aware that G1 had been found, so I don't think there are a range of strains, but I will probably throw to um, Lavinia or Catherine, who, who may be more uh, yeah, um, appropriate to answer that one, if that's okay. Thanks, Suzanne. Lavinia or Catherine, would you like to answer the question about the different strains in the Yarra Valley? Probably throw to Catherine for this one. I think Catherine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah at, at this stage, it's only G1 that has been found in the Yarra Valley. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so, Greg Jarrett has a question Are sniffer dogs still being used for phylloxera detection? <laughs> Uh, no, and, and I don't think they were, uh, they, they haven't been used, but in the previous project we had, one of that was the, was, was to look at uh, how sniffer dogs could be used for research, but before investing more funding onto doing this rigorous work, we did a survey with the growers, and the consensus was that they would not be applicable in terms of of, of, um, of, you know, they, they would act as vectors and most of the growers were not for it. So when we okay. did this survey, it was an online survey with the end users, the biosecurity officers, and the, the, and the research did not go on uh, because they were uh, deemed as a risk to uh, phylloxera uh, spread. Now, there's a question about the airborne hyperspectral detection. Um, Lavinia, if I could ask you to answer this one. So um, Luke asked uh, what the findings of the first year of that trial um, were. So were you able to um, detect um, phylloxera using um, those methods um, and... Yeah, it sounds like you're going to continue that um, that work um, again. Thanks, Lavinia. Yeah, um, look, it was it was the first year. It was a bit of a pilot. Um, we probably didn't have as much uh, funding to throw to it, so it was just a bit of a pilot. But ultimately, there was historical data put towards it. We did some ground treatment, and a big part of it was first developing the model. So you know, working out, uh, you know. Um, Healthy vine is a number one um, slight reduction in vigor is a four. So it was actually coming up with the model, um, putting that together with LAMP, the historical data sets and the current data sets, and actually developing that model to run. Um, what we sort of came up with was um, there probably wasn't, there was just perhaps enough data to run it to get a baseline um, machine learning model. So I think. The model's been developed. We've got some initial data, but I really think it needs to be run again this year. Uh, Melissa and I have plans to somehow get some influence of time to go out and do some research in the Yarra again, um, working with the same um, vineyards and the same varieties, um, collecting some more data, tweaking the model um, with input from Gaia, and then I think Guy have agreed that they will actually run the model again um, to sort of check and see how we're going. So yeah, it, it's showing promise. Um, and I, I don't know if we, um, we're certainly not at the point of detecting phylloxera, mm -hmm. but I think it's about identifying weak patches um, in the vines, which, which would then lead us to um, go and survey them with other methods. I think that message was clear in your presentation that you're not planning for this to take over, that this will um, help to fine tune the, the current um, practices. Um, and so uh, 
I imagine, well, question for you, are you still going to use the more the scattergun approach as well as this, that you'll use that in combination, you won't just rely on the um, remote sensing to tell you where to uh, monitor, you'll still use the scattergun approach um, for the time being? Um, I think we're using a combination of all at the moment. Um, Melissa and I are actually going out tomorrow to go and put out um, bucket traps to sort of assist with some of the research there. So, you know, we're still, um, I think we're more and more irrespective, we'll go over and beyond what's in the MPMP. So it's around um, collecting additional data. Uh, this year we looked at, um, you know, we purchased the vine scan data as well to try to actually look at better uh, vineyard detection in terms of plantings. Um, there is remote sensing as well as comparing historical data where you can sort of see vine decline from one year to another. Um, so I think, you know, in AgVic we use a combination of all the methods, um, but still just to give that level of confidence and in terms of what's nationally acceptable, we of course defer to MPMP as the very bare minimum. give us an idea of how widespread the G38 strain is, please. Um, so I'll go for that one. Yeah, at this stage, it's confined to the Northeast Victoria, the, the Northeast PAZ. And as I mentioned, we are doing a survey, one of the um, one of the activities we are doing in the current project is going to areas in the King Valley and Northeast Victoria to survey for leaf goals. And since we know that it has been uh, characterized as a leaf galling strain, so that, um, so we might be having an answer to that question in the next three years. Mm. Okay, thank you. And Nick Dreyer has a question about um, whether there have been any observations of vines grafted to 10114 dying or showing severe symptoms in the presence of G38. Um, so the, we haven't uh, seen dying on the vines, uh, but there, there was uh, symptoms of yellowing, which is one of the symptoms of phylloxera infestation. And we have, um, I didn't present that in the in this presentation at the moment, but we have some of those pictures in the final report that is on the Wine Australia website. Um, we've got a question, another one for you, Catherine. Um, do you think it's worth investigating the potential of the native surfed, is that how you pronounce it, surfed flies for biocontrol of phylloxera? Oh, yeah, that's actually one of the things we are doing. We will be looking at our potential predators in the field, and I think we're going to be starting in the next field season uh, and going to the labs to look at predators of phylloxera, bringing them to the lab and conducting trials to see to assess the impact on phylloxera. So that's that's something we are going to be doing. Uh, but eventually from Ray's uh, biocontrol review, the cyphid fly has been recorded as a predator in the US. So in the near future or when, based on what we find in this project, it will be worth looking at a classical biocontrol and knowing that phylloxera is, is exotic we could go to the native range and find the cyphid flies from the US. Uh, but the preliminary studies now will allow us to find out whether the native flies will be will have any impact on phylloxera. Do we know um, how widespread the G38 strain is outside of Australia? So other countries, for example, New Zealand, no, that's that's a question we have received often. We that's one of the discussions we are having with Mark Blackett within that our team is to find out whether we could map the genetic strains we have in Australia and see whether they are the same with what we have in Europe or in New, New Zealand. 
but we haven't done enough studies to be able to to put in the genetic strains into the category so our our, our our characterization of the phylloxera in Australia is different from New Zealand mm -hmm. or Australia. So at this stage, we will need to conduct studies, more studies, and this this is in relation to rootstock screening because the 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 characterization is based on how phylloxera utilizes the rootstocks as a root as a food source, and that will require a lot of research. Um, maybe in the new in the next couple of years we might have enough data to put that together. Um, well, we don't have any more questions, so I would like to thank all of our presenters for joining us today um, for a really um, great presentation, really informative, and um, you provided lots of resources for, for growers to go and have a look at. Um, this webinar has been recorded and will be uh, emailed out to everyone and we will provide the resources that the presenters have um, shared with you um, during their presentations. Uh, so I'd also like to thank the audience for, for joining. It's great to have your participation. And I'd like to uh, remind you that we have a, another webinar uh, next week. So irrigation scheduling tools to make every drop count. So it's next Thursday, the 25th. Jump on the AWRI website to register. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you, everyone, again again for your fabulous presentations. See you later.